This tutorial on asynchronous programming in Python assumes no prior knowledge, nor any experience with asynchronous programming in other languages. As a result, it'll contain content that you won't find in a single tutorial elsewhere. And with that brief introduction over, less chatter and more Python. A generator is a function that produces a sequence of results instead of a single value. They contain one or more yield statements. They can be awkward to learn at first because their behavior differs from normal functions. For one, when you call a generator function, the generator object is created, but that object remains in a paused state. It doesn't just start running automatically. We can see this with our first example, which takes an input integer. While this remains greater than zero, we yield it and then subtract one from it. The way of normally using a function like this is in a for loop. Here we've done that and passed in 10 and see our results 10 to one. Of course, as with any function, we can assign this countdown 10 to X. Whereas we would normally expect a result here, we can see that we have the generator object itself in a suspended state. Calling next on it will execute every line up to and including our first yield, but nothing further. When we run next again, execution resumes first with our line n minus equals one, and then as n remains greater than naught, we yield for a second time. When there's nothing more to yield, we get a stop iteration exception. Of course, if you don't believe me, you can put unique print statements in between each line here to see what's executed and when. A useful exercise that I recommend. First, let's take ourselves from generators to coroutines. PEP342 introduced yield as an expression, which meant that you could now use yield on the right side of an assignment. If you knew nothing of coroutines, I bet you could take one look at finder, our next example function, and tell me that this went into an infinite loop, had some input text, and whatever the user passed in as an argument string, if that string was in the input text, then the input text would be printed to the terminal. But the confusion arises if your only experience to date has been of the yield keyword in generator expressions and generator functions. If you use yield more generally, then you create a coroutine which do more than just generate values, but can also consume values sent to it. When you call a coroutine, nothing happens. We've called finder with the string Python as our argument, assign this to f, and when we look at f, we see our generator object just as before. We know that we can send values in, so let's send in some text including the word Python, as we've done here. The way this is supposed to work is that the string that we've sent in becomes assigned to input text, and then seeing as x is Python, and Python is in this new string that we've passed in, that string will be printed to terminal. But of course, we just saw right now in our previous example that when you call a generator function, it starts off in a suspended state. No lines of it have been executed as yet. It's only when you call next that execution begins, the line containing yield is executed, and then it pauses once more. And indeed, the exception that we get is that we can't send a non-none value to a just started generator. This first step is known as priming the coroutine, and it can be done either by sending none or by calling next. And this only needs to be done once at the very beginning. Now, any text that we send in is assigned to input text, and if input text has x in it, in this case the string python, then that input text is printed to terminal, exactly the behavior that we see. And I'll just demonstrate that sending in none primes our coroutine just in the same way that next does. The coroutine close method shuts it down as it could otherwise run indefinitely. And indeed, this is what the interpreter calls during garbage collection. You can catch this though with normal exception handling of the generator exit exception. And this is if you need to implement specific cleanup code. Furthermore, you can also raise exceptions inside a coroutine with the throw method. And these originate at the yield expression to avoid getting 
getting mixed up. Now that you're clear in your mind on the topics covered so far, it's best not to mix the two concepts of generators and coroutines. It's all too easy to get distracted because methods meant for coroutines are sometimes described for generators. This is, for the most part, erroneous. Despite the similarities, generators and coroutines are basically two distinct concepts. Generators produce data for iteration. Coroutines tend to consume values. They are consumers of data. There is use of having yield produce a value in a coroutine, but it's not tied to iteration. If you've come across yield from before, then you might have seen it explained away as merely being shorthand for yielding values from an iterator, including other generators. But its real use lies in allowing delegation to a sub-generator, or in other words, any next or send can be passed on to nested generators, acting as a tunnel that passes data back and forth. And so this is at the heart of how coroutines operate. From Python 3.5 onwards, the preferred way of declaring coroutines is with the async await syntax that we'll now go over. These are known as native coroutines to distinguish them from generator-based coroutines that were used before this native syntax was introduced. And you still might see these around from time to time. They are decorated with the async io.coroutine decorator. To turn our attention to native coroutine syntax for a moment, let's quickly define a regular function as we know and love it. Greet takes an input string and returns it concatenated with the string hello. To define a native coroutine, we use async def. Note that it's completely legal just to put a parse statement here, but to start off, we'll return that same string as above. Both function objects look similar. The difference occurs when we call them. Call our first function, output, as expected call our coroutine, well, the output's different. Calling the coroutine has left us with a coroutine object. We've assigned this object to G, and we send none into it. What happens seems quite strange. We get a stop iteration exception, and the value attribute of the exception has the return value that we defined earlier. Coroutines are there to be driven by something else, as we'll do here with our run function. Earlier, we saw that when we included yield in a regular function, we had to prime it by sending none or by calling next on it. With native coroutines, we can't call next as it's not an iterator, so we'd get a type error. The way to get the data we want is to send in none. The run function sends in none, catches the stop iteration exception, and returns the value attribute, and in this way, it drives our greet coroutine. Async functions can call other async functions, but if you're going to call another async function, you have to use the await keyword before it. Before we get onto event loops and how you'd use everything we've talked about together in complete code, let's run a few examples. Our async main functions runs the async greet function and prints the result to screen. Where can you use await? Let's define an async function that computes numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. It's not a particularly efficient way of computing Fibonacci numbers, and I ask that you overlook this. You'll see that await is particularly robust in where it can be used, and so it's easier to look at where it can't be used. Before that though, See that it's all too easy to forget to put the await keyword when calling another async function. Here, we've forgotten to put it before fib15 in our main coroutine. This is the error message that you'll get. Fortunately, it's descriptive enough not to make debugging harder than it needs to be. Getting back to where await can be used, see in cell 93 that we've even used await as a dictionary key.
a wait can't be used outside an async function. In cell 95, we have a wait outside a function and it has produced our result. This works now in the REPL. It wouldn't work if you placed it in a module outside an async function and you ran it. We can't await an object that isn't awaitable. There's no restriction on defining async functions as instance, class, or static methods. Now, knowing everything that we know, let's run some examples with event loops, compare synchronous code to asynchronous code, and talk about async I.O. Here, time.sleep1 represents work that would take place on a real-life server. We'll take it to represent waiting for network-based input-output, as opposed to intensive CPU work. This program counts to three, three times, synchronously. Taking a look at the output, we can see that each cycle of count running to completion before the next cycle begins. The asynchronous equivalent, on the other hand, looks something like this. This took three seconds to run, as opposed to nine seconds. The first count cycle was started, and as soon as it hit the await sleep one, Python was free to do other work, for instance, starting the second, and subsequently the third count cycles. This is why we have all the ones, then all the twos, then all the threes in the output. Programming concurrently can be a very valuable tool. Multiprocessing has the operating system do all of the multitasking work, and in Python it's the only option for multi-core concurrency, that is, having your program executed on multiple cores of a CPU. If you use threads, then the operating system is still doing all of the multitasking work, and in CPython, the global interpreter lock prevents multi-core concurrency. In asynchronous programming, there's no operating system interface Intervention. There's one process, there's one thread. So what's going on? Well, tasks can release the CPU when there are waiting periods so that other tasks can use it. The classic example is of exhibition chess. Polgar is playing 24 opponents. She typically makes her moves in 5 seconds, and the opponents make their moves in 55 seconds. These chess games average 30 move pairs. Each game runs for half an hour. So playing these 24 opponents sequentially would take 12 hours, that is 24 times half an hour. This represents synchronous programming. In asynchronous programming, Polgar will make her move on the first game, and while she she's waiting for the first opponent to decide what they want to do for their turn in those 55 seconds, she moves on to the second opponent and makes her move, and five seconds later moves on to the next opponent. By the time she comes round to the first opponent again, the opponent has made their decision, moved the chess piece, and Polgar is able to take her turn. So a single move on the 24 games will take her 24 times 5 seconds, that's 2 minutes. So in this case, those 24 games are completed in 1 hour, 2 minutes times 30. So we've gone from 12 hours to 1 hour by taking an asynchronous approach as opposed to a synchronous approach. Asynchronous frameworks need a scheduler, usually called an event loop. This event loop keeps track of all the running tasks, and when a function's suspended, it returns control to the event loop which then will find another function to start or resume, and this is called cooperative multitasking. AsyncIO provides a framework, an asynchronous framework, that's centered on this event loop. 
and it efficiently handles input-output events. An application interacts with the event loop explicitly, it registers code to be run, and then it lets the event loop, the scheduler, make the necessary calls into application code when the resources are available. So if a network server opens sockets and then registers them to be told when input events occur on them, the event loop will alert the server code when there's a new incoming connection or when there's data to be read. If there's no more data to be read from a socket, then the server then yields control back to the the event loop. The mechanism for yielding control back to the event loop depends on coroutines. Coroutines are a language construct designed for concurrent operation. The coroutine can pause execution using the await keyword with another coroutine, and while it's paused, the coroutine state is maintained, allowing it to resume where it left off. One coroutine can start another and then wait for the results, and this makes it easier to decompose a task into reusable parts. This example has two phases that must be executed in order, but that can run concurrently with other operations. The await keyword is used instead of adding the new coroutines to the loop, because control flow is already inside of a coroutine being managed by the loop, so it isn't necessary to tell the loop to manage the new coroutines. For now, it's sufficient to know that async functions are awaitable, but there's more detail behind that that isn't particularly complicated and is explained well in the documentation. I hope you've enjoyed this primer and introduction to asynchronous programming in Python. This is part one of a two-part tutorial. It's absolutely necessary to put the foundations in. As always, I would be grateful to hear your feedback, your comments, and your requests for future tutorials. Take care.